Clearly, you are the folks that saw the memo that we were in a different room. And thank you for coming. This is uh, the fall semester start for nanotech uh, seminars. Um, we have a good lineup of, uh, of speakers, for seven speakers for this semester. Uh, before I get to today's speaker, I'll let you know that the next speaker is uh, Professor Paul Cole from Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Uh, and he'll be speaking on uh, uh, September 13th. And we should be back over at the Marcus Building for that uh, for that seminar. Um, I am also currently looking for speakers for the spring semester already. Um, so as I always say, but I never get any takers. Um, if anybody has any suggestions of speakers that you would like to hear, uh, typically from Georgia Tech or the local area, so Emory, UGA, Georgia State, any of those, uh, or or other people in industry you might know um, in, in the local area that I can. Read Recruit, um, please just send me an email or talk to me after after to, after the talk today. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Mo, uh, Mark Masego from uh, Material Science and Engineering. Uh, Mark got his uh, bachelor's degree at Penn State and then uh, master's and PhD um, at uh, NC State, all in material science. Uh, he then uh, it worked in, in, as a graduate student. He was an NSF uh, graduate fellow. Uh, he then did a postdoc at the University of Illinois and then went back to NC State where he was a research uh, assistant professor uh, before coming to Georgia Tech uh, in 2014, uh, where he's currently, as I said, in the School of Material Science and Engineering. So, Mark, I'll let you take it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. 
Can you turn that lights a little? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so today um, I'll talk about uh, something we've been working on for several years, uh, which we tentatively call gluing molecules to surfaces. It's really the use of sub nanometer oxide coatings for improved stability of molecular sensitized devices. That just happens to be kind of a, a mouthful to say. Uh, so we actually take uh, sort of um, th this idea from, you know, what we did as little kids, uh, gluing things together. My toddlers now, they just learned uh, about glue a couple days ago and they just glued paper on top of paper on top of paper. Uh, we're trying to be a little more precise perhaps with our gluing. This is an image here. This actually, this layer here is actually about a nanometer thick on some nanoparticles where we glued some molecules uh, on the surface of the nanoparticles. But oftentimes these, these layers are even less than a nanometer. So I know we're uh, this is the nano at tech seminar, but we're going to be talking about some things that are even sub uh, nanometer scale and still providing uh, some useful useful functionality uh, to some devices. Uh, so this work, uh, a lot of it was done while I was still uh, research faculty at NC State in collaboration with a number of folks, uh, both at UNC, uh, the Tom Meyer group, who's experts in creating functional molecules. Uh, Ken Hansen was a close collaborator of mine who's now uh, faculty at Florida State. And as well, we've, we've continued this research now with uh, research groups at Emory, uh, both Craig Hill and Tim Leon's group. <clears throat> uh, so first, I'll just give an introduction to our lab. Uh, this is our current lab uh, here at Georgia Tech. Uh, and in fact, this, is, this picture, even though it was taken about a month ago, is old because now we've added a, a few more grad students uh, to the group. Uh, so generally, what our lab is good at is materials processing. That's really the focus of our lab, understanding how we can fabricate materials at the nanoscale with three-dimensional structure. And the two important uh, things that we, we, we like to investigate are materials that combine organic and inorganic components and materials that have three-dimensionality. And we apply our ability to control both the three-dimensionality and the organic inorganic composition of these materials to a variety of, of different applications. Um, making hybrid materials, making uh, traditional, more traditional electronic uh, oxide materials uh, interface with novel substrates, including copper foils, uh, gallium nitride, uh, wideband gap semiconductors. What I'll be talking about today in terms of molecular functionalized devices, uh, we've worked in uh, optical materials, uh, making photonic structures. This is actually a tungsten structure that we created, so an interesting three-dimensional metallic structure. And we actually do a lot of work, which we'll have a chance to talk today, on, on fabrics. So how can we functionalize fabrics by putting uh, nanoscale coatings on these fabrics to uh, modify uh, their properties? So not only do we, we make materials, but we also make the equipment that makes materials. So we make the stuff that makes the stuff, uh, that, that makes the stuff uh, possible. Uh, so this is just pictures of, of equipment in our lab. We now operate, this is one of our ALD reactors. We operate two ALD reactors. One is, uh, a third one is under construction and a fourth one is in design. We also have a sputtering tool and a variety of, of, of chemical synthesis equipment as well, uh, as well as a variety of measurement uh, systems like ellipsometry and property measurements like electrical uh, property measurements. So, Briefly, uh, some of the, the material synthesis techniques that we're interested in currently our vapor phase deposition method, those atomic layer deposition. Uh, an atomic layer deposition is a chemical vapor deposition method, except we're sequentially delivering the precursor. So we're not delivering both the precursor and co reactant at the same time as a traditional C process. Instead, we deliver one precursor. We purge, remove that precursor, and we deliver the second cursor. And so that confines our reactions just to the surface so that we get a single uh, reaction layer of our, of our molecule on the surface. And then we purge off any excess and deliver our co-reactant and, and get, again, a layer by layer uh, deposition that's conformal over uh, 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 complex three-dimensional architecture. So this is an example of a uh, colloidal crystal where we had uh, a bunch of colloidal spheres at the micro scale that had been assembled. We then infiltrated with our gases and did an ALD process to conformally coat those spheres and then we etched away those spheres. So now the spheres are gone and we're just seeing the, the skeleton that's remaining, the photonic crystal skeleton that's remaining. And so we can use these coatings for a variety of things, including adjusting the ability of, for example, uh, fabrics, uh, changing light absorption properties, in, in, in this case, adhesion, mechanical strength, and other properties. 
The other thing that we're really interested in, this is more on the, the organic, inorganic hybrid materials side, is if we apply these, these vapor phase precursors to organic materials, to polymeric materials, they don't always behave as nicely as shown in this cartoon. They don't always just react right at the surface. Instead, they can actually diffuse into the subsurface of the polymer and generate organic, inorganic hybrid layers. And so we're very interested in the kinetics of this process. And this is uh, one big effort in our lab and I'm happy to talk to people about that afterwards. Uh, we're finding a lot of interesting properties with these new uh, hybrid materials that we're creating. Okay, but today's talk, we'll focus on a different type of hybrid material, really an interfacial hybrid material where we look at molecules on surfaces and applying our vapor phase deposition techniques, ALD techniques, to conformally coat around these molecules and stabilize the attachment of the molecules to a surface. So I'll, I'll begin the talk, this is the introduction, I'll begin with uh, just some motivation for why we do this and talk about the importance of performance and stability for these molecularly functionalized devices. I'll show you sort of our preliminary successes and our naive, at this point, chemical understanding of these interfaces because they're very complex interfaces. We're talking about you know, a molecule that's maybe one to two nanometers thick and then a layer that we're depositing that's only a few angstroms thick. So how do we understand, how do we probe the chemistry and, and, the, and, and the electronic transport processes that are occurring at that interface? It's very challenging. And then I'll give you two technological case studies where we've applied this technology and looked at uh, the device performance. One is a disensitized solar cell and the other is a water oxidation uh, cathode. So it's basically a catalysis process, electric catalysis process. And then I'll show sort of where our work fits in perspective with other groups that have now picked up and, and starting to look at us using this similar technology for gluing molecules to surfaces for other applications. Okay. So first, let's talk about molecular functionality. Uh, so we're, uh, with, these, with these projects, we're interested uh, in working, collaborating with chemists who are developing new molecules to do a variety of, of different things, right? So chemists have become, over the last 30 years or so, very good at designing molecules that can either absorb light over very specific wavelengths, uh, can emit light over specific wavelengths, can create electron transfer between that molecule and some inorganic substrate, to specifically catalyze cert certain reactions or to buy molecules uh, for biomolecular sensing and, and other applications. So they're very good at this. And in fact, when we, we take these molecules and we put them in solution and we test their properties, we can often record record beating functionalities because we can design the chemistry uh, so precisely. The challenge is often that when we do it uh, in solution, we really can't couple it to the outside world. And so to couple you know, the functionality of the outside world, world, we often have to attach these molecules to some sort of solid state device. And that's really a challenge that we've been looking at. How do we attach these molecules effectively and robustly to a solid state device so we can interact you know, with, 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 with the exterior world? So this requires both you know, creating and maintaining the performance of the molecule and maintaining the attachment, the reliability of such a device. So let me uh, just, just go back for a little bit and talk about you know, performance and reliability. If we look in the literature, performance really gets all the glamour and reliability is, is often forgotten about. So this is a, a nice uh, review article from, it's a few years old now, 2010, where they talk, they actually do discuss a bit about reliability, particularly uh, the most famous probably molecular functionalized device is a disensitized solar cell. In this review, they say there's there have historically been few published results containing module efficiencies in combination with data from accelerated or outdoor testing of DSC modules. An interesting trend is that the publications dealing with module stability generally have lower module efficiencies than publications where stability is not mentioned. So people often just report performance and not reliability. In fact, they go on to say that the devices offering the best long-term stability are often different from those exhibiting the highest device efficiencies. The stability of a DSC module, they, they conclude, is strongly related, not to how it's designed, but rather how the device is encapsulated. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the importance of encapsulation uh, up to this point and why that's been used really to get reliability, not inherently changing the device design. Okay, so before we do that though, let's think about, or let's look at what causes degradation in these molecularly functionalized devices. So first, a bit of an overview for a disensitized solar cell, so everyone's on the same page here. 
Uh, so dye sensitized solar cells are nanostructured devices where you attach dye molecules that absorb light. So light comes in and the, the molecular uh, electronic orbitals, an electron gets excited from the HOMO to the LUMO and it gets injected into the, into the inorganic nanostructure. Right. And so this process uh, needs to occur to then uh, collect the charge on the electrode and, and run the device, whatever the load happens to be. So if you look at this, there's a number of, of mechanisms for degradation, but probably the most important fundamentally is the desorption of the dye uh, from the surface. So if we lose the dye, we're no longer going to be able to transfer, transfer that charge uh, upon light absorption from the dye uh, to the inorganic species. And the reason dyes desorb primarily is due to water. Water attacks the binding chemistry between the dye molecule uh, and, and, and the inorganic surface. Okay, so there's been many studies and I've just chosen two here to demonstrate uh, the importance of water attack uh, causing desorption of, 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 of molecular species on inorganic surfaces. So this is a nice uh, set of ab initio simulations showing uh, molecular dynamics of, of this process where they have a, a, uh, a square rain dye molecule attached to a surface uh, with a carboxylic acid group, I believe in this case. And they've placed it in uh, basically an aqueous, uh, an aqueous environment, right? These are all these water molecules uh, running around in an aqueous environment. And when they looked at this, uh, eventually you get hydrolytic attack of one of these attachment chemistries, which can be a problem, but even uh, in the case of a multi-dentate binding of a molecule, so in this case we have two binding sites, you might expect that this might reattach uh, at, at some point before this one detaches. The problem they found in this particular uh, uh, simulation study was that once this detaches, the water molecules start to surround this and sort of prevent it from reattaching to the surface. And so this, this drives it uh, or makes it even uh, more unstable and so eventually it gives it sufficient time that another water molecule can attack uh, the second site and absorb, absorb the molecule. Uh, another, another issue that, that can happen is, is really a balance of charge that occurs. And so this is an experimental study where they're looking at the surface coverage of different dye molecules as a function of pH. So again, in an aqueous environment, uh, changing the pH. And as you change the pH, you're going to change the zeta potential of the surface, essentially the surface charge. Right? So in this case, uh, we're looking at a TiO2 surface. And when you go below about uh, pH 6, you get a positive charge on the, on the TiO2 surface. Above pH 6, you get a negative charge. Uh, these, these species are, are predominantly uh, negatively charged uh, species, but as we, so as we go to lower pHs, we would expect that the positive charge on the surface would start to attract uh, these molecules to the surface and create attachment. So in this case, uh, B and C are these carboxylated uh, species. We see we don't have sufficient carboxylic acids here to neutralize the ruthenium charge. So in this case, we don't have uh, electrostatic attraction. So C never attaches. Uh, for the case of B, we do see attachment. In the case of A, phosphonic acids are known to, to bind chemically, just electrostatically. And so we see uh, even better attachment to higher pHs. But even eventually, with uh, strong chemical binding, we get this type of attack. Uh, where we get uh, detachment of the molecule. So effectively what we're seeing here is that as we go to higher pHs, this is what's done uh, experimentally to, uh, to, to analytically strip molecules from the surface. You go to higher pHs and you can completely remove any sort of dye molecule attached to an inorganic surface. Okay, so this problem even c becomes uh, more complicated uh, when we add other uh, stimuli including light or electricity. So if we want to put this into a real device where we either want to run current through the device or we want to expose it uh, to light, to absorb light, for, for example, for a solar cell, well, this causes uh, even more detachment. All right, so this was a study uh, done by my colleague Ken Hansen uh, prior uh, to us collaborating where he was looking at these dye molecules, uh, phosphonic acid bound uh, to an oxide substrate and he looked at their detachment as he was exposing them uh, to blue light. And so not only were we in now some aqueous environment, but we were also exposing them to light. And he tracked then using UV-Vis uh, how much dye was on a surface 
as a function of time, uh, exposure to light, and we see rapid uh, detachment within 16 hours. And so in this particular case, I believe we're, yeah, so we're at a very low pH, pH 1. So you'll see from the previous study, that, you know, pH 1, we should be well attached uh, to the surface, especially for a phosphonic acid. But here, as soon as we ex start to expose it to light, we lose and we detach these molecules within a period of less than one day. Uh, so this is, this is really a, a challenge if, if we add additional uh, stimuli to the system. But at this point, you might say, wait, if I go into Amazon, I can buy disensitized solar cells. So why is that? Okay, so this is, a, for example, a, um, uh, a keyboard for your laptop. It has three and a half stars on Amazon, so it must not fail uh, real immediately. Um, so uh, certainly there, there has been some commercialization of these dye-sensitized solar cells, these are solar-powered backpacks. And the key there was to improve the efficiencies about greater than 8%, but also to create reliable performance of these devices. And the way they've gotten to reliable performance is, is not really an eloquent way, rather it's through brute force. It's really just using very good sealants on the exterior of these devices. So, so take your device and then encapsulate it with a really good glue, a really good epoxy. Okay, so it's better than Elmer's. There's in fact an entire uh, industry uh, surrounding the design of, of these epoxies to encapsulate these disensitized types of devices. The other trick here, of course, is that the electrolyte they're using is non-aqueous, right? So non-aqueous electrolyte and then seal it to prevent any ambient water uh, from getting in. Okay, but what if the device that we want to use, the device design necessitates exposure to atmosphere? Or, for, for example, if we're doing some sort of catalytic process in an aqueous environment, we must have it, you know, in, in water itself. And there's certainly a number of molecular or functional molecules that chemists are designing to do just that, whether it be water-based disensitized solar cells, uh, fuel cell catalysts, water splitting uh, catalysts for hydrogen fuel generation, CO2 reduction, biological detection, and so on and so forth. So if the chemists aren't wasting their time designing these, we should, you know, we must find a way to attach them in a real environment. Okay, so our approach has been, instead of gluing on the exterior, what if we were able to glue the molecule uh, right at the site of attachment? And that's really been, been uh, the, the revolution that, that, that we've created, is attaching the molecules right at the surface. And so our approach, again, has been using these vapor phase deposition techniques, atomic layer deposition. So we've gone over the process. This is one of the reactors in, in, in our, in our uh, system. Again, I'll remind you that we can conformally coat these nanostructures with no problem. So 10, 20 nanometer particles, we've shown that we can formally coat those. You saw that on the first slide of this talk. The other uh, important thing here is we can deposit these materials with about one angstrom uh, precision. So you'll see in, in a few minutes that obviously we don't want to hurt the performance of these devices, so we need to be very precise in how much material uh, we're encapsulating these molecules with. Okay, so I will say, and to be very clear, there has been work done previously where people have taken uh, nanoporous uh, or nano, nanoporous oxide scaffold, applied an ALD coating, and then attached the molecule. And this is really to understand the photophysics of electron transfer between the molecule uh, and your nano oxide scaffold. So putting insulators or conductors in between, changing the thickness. So people have done that uh, previously. What had not been done previously was to take the scaffold, apply your molecules, and then do the ALD deposition. And the reason that people didn't do that was because they assumed that these very reactive ALD precursors react with their molecular functionality. And we kind of thought that that might happen as well. It turns out that so far we haven't really seen much degradation or much less degradation than we, we would have expected uh, when we do these processes. And so thermally, we're usually not very limited. Uh, most of these reactions occur below, well below 200 degrees Celsius, so we're not hurting uh, the organic molecules thermally, but we were concerned uh, with, with reactions 
uh, between our, 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 our vapor phase precursors uh, and the surface bound molecules. So this is an example here of a, of a common dye molecule using DS, uh, DSSC devices, N719. This is the molecular structure here. Now if we look at the UV vis absorption spectra, just where does this uh, dye absorb light? That's its prime functionality. Uh, we see that the black curve is just the bare dye on a nanoporous substrate. And then if we coat with TiO2, three cycles, that's about one and a half angstroms, or alumina, three cycles, which is about three angstroms, we still see a fairly strong absorption and maybe a slight blue shift. So we do lose some absorption, but not that much, and a slight blue shift in, in the absorption. We believe that's some modification to these thiocyanate groups. Uh, we've also looked at this uh, catalytic molecule that's used for water oxidation. We thought for sure that this one would react. We have an actual uh, aqua ligand here on the, on the ruthenium site, and many of our ALD precursors react with water. That's the co-reactant. So we actually went through a whole protection chemistry uh, on one of the first experiments we did. We tr it turns out that using protection chemistry or not using protection chemistry, we got the same results. Uh, the material was still... Uh, catalytically uh, active. And likely what's happening is that we're dehydrogenating dehydro uh, the, the catalyst prior uh, to uh, doing ALD because we're, the ALD is being done in a vacuum environment, uh, low, you know, essentially no water environment. So we're driving that water molecule off prior uh, to doing the deposition. So this is an example here. I'll show you just a quick movie of if we take uh, these, these, these slides, so the, the dyed slides, and we place them in a high pH solution. So we know high pH should strip uh, the, the, the surface of all the molecules. And so you'll see we have one that has just been dyed and then two that have been ALD treated after dyeing. And we'll see the dye molecules in real time actually being stripped off of, of, of the electrodes. So the bear here treated okay performance, the alumina is even better performance. So after about 10 minutes we start seeing dye coming off of the untreated and really no dye coming off. So it's, it's pretty obvious even just visually uh, that we're losing dye uh, in, in these devices. So if we actually look at this uh, quantitatively, we can track the UV vis absorption of these slides in this pH 10 environment as a function of time. And we see that, yes, without a coating, we can strip off all of the dye within about 12 hours or so. The TiO2 coating in this case uh, gave us uh, some improved uh, stability. The alumina coating gave us uh, very good stability. Uh, we retain about 90% of the dye molecules after even 50 hours in this very aggressive a high pH environment. So we've, we've, we've gone a bit further to look at, again, if we expose this to light. So this was, Ken ran these experiments now, where he, as he had done before, when we exposed these to light, we saw even faster uh, detachment of these molecules. So without a coating, if we, we can plot the desorption constant for these materials, we see that as we add this alumina coating, even just one angstrom, one cycle of this material, we can Im improve the attachment by about an order of magnitude in terms of decreasing uh, the desorption coefficient uh, for these molecules. Okay, we've also looked a little bit at uh, trying to analyze the chemistry that's occurring in situ. So this was a system uh, set up at NC State where we had an actual in situ uh, FTIR uh, with, uh, with our ALD reactor. And so we were doing uh, in situ IR spectroscopy while we were doing ALD deposition. We could look at each half cycle. So each exposure of our precursor, we could see what was occurring. Uh, in, in our reaction. So these are the spectra that we collected as we dosed uh, the alumina precursor, the aluminum precursor, then the water, aluminum, pre water, et cetera, et cetera, for three cycles. Your initial spectra here is shown as the spectra. Each of these spectra is shown as a different spectra from the immediately prior spectra. And so uh, features like this indicate a shift in the peak position. Uh, features like this indicate just uh, 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 the, the elimination of a particular stretch. Okay, so we see, for example, these are stretches from these unbound 
uh, uh, carboxylic acid groups. And within a single exposure to our TMA, we see a, a removal of those sorts of, of, of stretches in the material. The th thiocyanate group, we see this back and forth motion, so we're somehow modifying the thiocyanate with each uh, precursor co-reactant cycle. And then the COO stretches, uh, we actually also see, you'll see up, down, up, down, up, down, and then sort of the reverse of that on the other side. And if you look very closely, it's actually a shift that we're seeing. So we're seeing these, these, these asymmetric and symmetric stretches uh, sort of getting closer and farther away from each other. So we plotted that difference in the symmetric and asymmetric stretch, uh, stretching modes of these COO groups. And we see with each half cycle, we're sort of oscillating back and forth uh, with both precursor chemistries that we're using. And what that sort of indicates, and this is somewhat uh, uh, interpretive of, of what we're observing, is a change in the binding state of this COO group uh, from a monodentate to a bidentate. So the water is probably releasing this from a monodentate to a bidentate uh, sort of binding group. So we have some understanding. We know there's some modifications going on, but the exact chemical physics that are happening here uh, are still pretty difficult to, to ascertain. So let me show you now, sort of if we take this, this, this idea and we apply it to two different devices, uh, the type of performance that we can, uh, we can achieve. So the first example are for dye-sensitized solar cells. And so we might imagine that if we start applying an ALD layer uh, to a dye-sensitized solar cell, that it may act or may somehow uh, manipulate the transfer of electrons that needs to occur from the dye molecule into the nanoscaffold. Okay, so this, this is what we would we would expect to occur and it is what we observe. So this is just, again, a, a band energy diagram of all the processes that are occurring. And we can look at some of these processes using transient absorption uh, spectroscopy, right? So we look at uh, the rate at which each of these processes occur. So we can look at this recombination process where if we excite the, the, the electron into the LUMO of the dye molecule and it can't enter for whatever reason, it can't inject, it decides instead to recombine. We can see that with fluorescence, a transient fluorescence measurement. Uh, injection, we actually weren't able to, to directly measure. We're doing that right now with Tim Leon's group at Emory, uh, but we can infer that from some other measurements. And then we can look at back electron transfer using transient absorption spectroscopy, looking at different uh, uh, excited modes uh, in the, on the molecule. Okay, so I won't go, I have the details. If someone wants to talk afterwards, I can show you the details of those measurements. This is sort of the picture that we've created uh, based on those measurements. So without a coating, we know that there's high injection that occurs and there's some back electron transfer. So we want mostly injection, we want it to be collected uh, by the device. We don't want it to, to, to the electrons to come back into the dye. Uh, but in fact, even, at, uh, even for a standard device, we actually have more injection the injection is even faster than we need, than we need it to be, so we could take a, a bit of a hit to injection and still have a, a high-performing device. Unfortunately, when we add the alumina coating, even at three angstroms or so, uh, we, really, we really hurt the injection uh, in the device, but it also prevents uh, back electron transfer. So it's really acting as an insulator, as one might expect, and we can't inject, uh, nor can we, can we, do we have uh, electrons coming back. Uh, with the TiO2 coating, uh, we still, what we found is we maintain about the same high injection rate as, as far as we could detect, and, uh, but we, we see even higher back electron transfer rates than we had seen previously. So TiO2 just seems to be acting as a conductor because often the scaffold itself is TiO2, so we're just making the scaffold closer uh, to the molecule itself. Now, as you'll recall, the alumina has great stability, TiO2 has okay stability, so we came up with this very naive hypothesis that what if we mix the alumina with the TiO2, could we get sort of a, a synergy of these properties, sort of an averaging of these properties? Okay, so we actually went ahead and made some uh, dye-sensitized solar cell devices. This is the control device uh, with no ALD coatings. We get about seven and a quarter percent efficiency, so reasonable efficiency, uh, dye-sensitized solar cells. If we just go ahead and put three cycles of alumina or TiO2, we take quite a hit in efficiency, maybe 30% to 50% uh, reduction in efficiency. So this is the pure, the pure case. However, 
If we now do mixtures, so we did a couple different ways we did mixtures, and this is two cycles of alumina, the one cycle of TI2, or we, we reverse those. We can actually get within 90% of the initial efficiency of the unmodified device. So now we're, we're, we're pretty close uh, to where we were. And if we look at the efficiency uh, as we age these devices, so this is a standard aging uh, test where we do 80 degrees C uh, in the dark, so in an oven at 80 degrees C. Uh, we, we find, and this is again uh, what, I'll, what I'll point out here, oftentimes people will normalize these sorts of plots. We're not normalizing this data here. This is actual efficiency of the devices. And so we see after about 100 hours, our devices are equivalent to our control devices and beyond that they show higher efficiency than the control. So the control has degraded at a faster rate and ends up being uh, lower performing uh, than our coded devices. So now if we, we compare this to the literature data, so this is our, our uncoded, our control device. We see this uh, almost a 40% drop in efficiency over 400 hours. This is our opt sort of our optimized device. Uh, with this mixed Illumina TI2, we get about a 20% drop in efficiency. Again, this is, this is true efficiency. This is a Gretzel device. So Gretzel devices, they have their magic nanostructuring that no one can reproduce anywhere else in the world. Uh, and they get you know, upwards of 12% efficiency. And this is with N719, so not one of their fancy dyes. So it's still not as good as their best devices. Um, but when they test that for 400 hours, it drops to about seven, a little under 7% efficiency. So we're you know, we're pretty close to that efficiency, even though our starting efficiency is much lower. Uh, and they, they obviously lose a lot more efficiency when they do this sort of aging test than we do. So if, if we could get a hold of their devices, we could probably improve their, their, their durability uh, much better. This is a, a, a comparable study from another group that makes nice devices. Uh, and they get about the same efficiency as we do. Initially, when they age theirs, they lose about 60%. Uh, so we think we're doing very good in terms of improving the reliability of these molecularly functionalized devices. <coughs> so the second example uh, is a water oxidation catalyst molecule. So the Meyer group, they've been work, working on these molecules, I think, for 20 to 30 years now, uh, making these ruthenium molecules that are used for water oxidation catalysts for, for solar fuel applications. OK, so here. We need to be in an aqueous environment so we can take the water molecules and convert them into oxygen, okay? In this particular case, we're not doing it uh, solar driven, we're just doing it uh, electrically driven. So it's just an electrolyzer, but instead of having platinum as your catalyst, we're using uh, this molecular species as our catalyst on the electrode. Okay, so this is the picture of uh, the, the chemical route. Uh, that's used uh, for, for the oxidation. It's a multi-step process. Uh, we'll, go into the, we'll look at the details in a, in a little bit. Um, but what we can see when we, use, when we do cyclic voltammetry, we can see this redox couple related uh, to this process here, and that indicates that, uh, the, uh, that, that, that we're getting catalytic activity. Now, if we run this cyclic voltammetry you know, multiple times, we start to see a reduction uh, in, in the redox currents indicating that these molecules are coming off of the surface and they're detaching. So this loss in current is indicative of degradation of the device. Okay, so increasing number of cycles, loss of catalytic molecules. So we went ahead and took uh, a, a control device and then we started uh, coding these devices with increasing cycle numbers of TiO2 and what we saw was improved stability, less loss of current. Eventually at about 20 cycles, uh, we essentially see no loss of our uh, electric catalyst current. However, if we go too thick, 30, 40 cycles, we're now, th this layer is now about one and a half to two nanometers. These molecules are also about one and a half to two nanometers. So we're actually coding now, we've actually, our coding has reached the top of the molecule and we're, we're coding over the molecule. And so for these particular molecules, uh, we're going to, they're going to lose their activity because we're now no longer able to access uh, the reaction sites uh, for these devices. So we eventually see a loss uh, in our redox couple because we're coding basically the entire molecule. 
So this is just a plot of surface coverage from integrating uh, the, the, the redox couple, uh, that CV curve. We can track the percentage of, of, of molecules on the surface as a number of, of cyclic voltammetry cycles. No ALD coding, we see loss of surface coverage. With an ALD coding of optimized of 20 cycles, we see great stability for a variety of pHs, from neutral pH up to a pH of 11. Now this is important because we can actually access different uh, reaction kinetics based on the pH uh, we're working at. So if we go back and look at the mechanism uh, for, for this, this oxidation catalyst, uh, this is the rate limiting step right here. So the rate limiting step is essentially when you add the second water molecule to your catalyst site and during this process you're forming the oxygen-oxygen bond. So you need to add an OH group to this ruthenium-5 uh, complex. Okay, so at, so at pH is less than five, this is really, uh, this, this, the mechanism for this reaction is just direct attack of a water molecule to the ruthenium-5 complex. As we increase the pH, we now have some species in there, uh, some sort of uh, conjugate base species that's creating, you know, our increase in pH that can then act to absorb hydrogen from a water molecule creating an atom-proton transfer process that facilitates the attachment of this OH group uh, to the ruthenium-5. So that's, of course, an easier process uh, to facilitate and so it has faster reaction kinetics. However, even faster would be if we get to high enough pHs where we just have a lot of uh, hydroxyl ions floating around in solution. Then we can directly attack a hydroxyl ion uh, to a ruthenium-5 complex. So what we're actually able to do by stabilizing these devices is to push our reaction mechanisms to, to, different, to different mechanisms, right? So at pH 7, we start to see uh, the atom transfer or atom proton transfer process. And as we increase pH, we can actually get to uh, direct attack from a uh, hydroxyl uh, uh, ion. And so what we're showing here are just the, the C curves at the same overpotential. So as we change pH, that overpotential is going to shift. And so if we go to the same overpotential, we should see the same current. But because we're seeing increasing currents, that's indicating that we're getting different reaction processes that are, in fact, have faster reaction kinetics. And so we can actually verify that these highest pHs, we are getting direct attack from a hydroxyl by looking at the reaction rate, i.e. The, the electrochemical current, as a function of pH, which is essentially just the concentration of the OH ion. And so we see a linear reaction kinetic, essentially reaction rate as a function of OH species, which is what we would expect uh, uh, for a first order reaction with a hydroxyl ion. Okay, and so what that allows us to do is we've actually increased reaction kinetics by a couple orders of magnitude. This is actually a hundred to a thousand times faster uh, than uh, the, 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 the processes occur at lowest pHs. And that's really prior to, to, to us demonstrating this, uh, the only uh, reactions they could run were at pHs less than five because the molecules uh, just don't, don't, don't adhere to the surface uh, except for at, the lowest, at those lowest pHs. So let me show uh, just our work in perspective. Uh, so there's uh, Michael Rose's group at UT Austin has now begun looking at using ALD to attach molecules to surfaces uh, to use, uh, to shift the electronic band structure of, of interfaces. There's also a very nice work from the HUP group uh, up at Northwestern where they're using uh, these ALD attached dye molecules for uh, aqueous uh, dye sensitized solar cells. So not only are they getting increased stability, but they're also improving <coughs> the wettability <coughs> of the wettability of the nanostructure to allow your aqueous electrolyte to permeate the entire uh, structure. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity actually in aqueous dye sensitized solar cells, not only because of our stability demonstrations, but also there's been work coming out about new redox couples that work more efficiently in aqueous environments. <coughs> so to summarize uh, today's talk, uh, hopefully what we've learned is, first of all, that surface-bound functional molecules hold great promise for a variety of devices, whether it be in catalytic applications or biosensing, 
or, or energy applications like dye sensitized solar cells. The challenge with these devices, the universal challenge, is maintaining attachment of our molecular species to uh, a device scaffold. And what we've shown is that by using ALD, we can effectively glue these molecules uh, to a surface and still maintain uh, the, 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 the properties of these materials. So I've lost some text here, it looks like. But you'll see that you know, through a continued understanding of uh, the interfacial chemistry and uh, the electronic transport processes that are occurring at these interfaces, we can create a set of rational design principles for understanding how to design these complex organic, inorganic devices. And not only can we improve stability, but potentially we can access uh, new reaction pathways that also enhance the performance of our devices. So with that, I'll acknowledge uh, a, a number of funding sources as well as our collaborators, both in the Research Triangle Park as well as now here uh, at Georgia Tech and Emory. So thank you for your attention. I would love to find someone who does that and collaborate with them. Because I think there's opportunity there, but I don't know that field. So I'm definitely looking for a collaborator. Yeah, because we do a lot of uh, like nanoparticles of different uh, and we, for uh, yeah. biological applications, either for developing therapeutics. Mm -hmm. And we, and we can do ALD on powders, we can do ALD on lots of things. So it doesn't need to be a flat substrate or a nano scaffold. So I'd love to talk. So it's faster. It's still not as fast as platinum. It's still orders of magnitude slower, but the surface area, there's this trick they play with surface area to try to get it closer to platinum. So this is another, another secret of the molecular catalyst folks, is that uh, a lot of these things are still not as fast as the inorganic, but you can get away with loading nanostructures and getting pretty close. And so I, I don't think there's an issue with heat. I think there is an issue with the nanostructures and the gas transport once you form these bubbles. Uh, I'm not sure if heat is an issue. So yeah, our best guess is it's just steric and it's just preventing it from attacking. Um, we know you know you can look up in poor bay diagrams what the electrochemical stability of different oxides are, and so we know we we'll use some other oxides and they'll dissolve and they basically detach. Um, let's see, do we have any other evidence? Yeah, that's, so does that answer your question? I mean, that's our best understanding. We would love to understand. We've been doing some studies with Tim Lian's group. So we think there may, there, there's this question, right? And we're talking about angstroms and material, whether or not it's going over top or underneath or how much of that is occurring. We have some indications that in terms of the electron transfer that we might gain just a little bit underneath because we see some difference in the injections. Um, and we've been working with Tim's group at Emory where they're doing um, 
SFG measurements, some frequency generation measurements, um, where they can track the spatial orientation of the molecule before and after ALD. And so we do see it's rearranging, so we're somehow modifying its position. Yeah, this is one of the things that, to me, is one of the biggest challenges. How do we characterize this, this structure? Right. Um, but the question you put the uh, hypothesis to explain this phenomenon with the electron in and also the back uh, electron transfer, mm -hmm. is there any way you can to characterize also to how do you know that kind of like it to that kind of transfer? Uh, the back. I mean, we've we've done a lot of. Tr I mean, I can. Sh if you want, we have transient absorption measurements. We've done. Is that what you're asking? Or well, this is the input of the electrons. The stability. You say that the one you are is stable than uh, some other. Mm -hmm. the high flow, the back the electron transfer, and then lower back the electron transfer. The rate. Mm -hmm. And then you just use the bar and the wide and then the narrow. And the slide is 36. So, yeah, we have a number of measurements that we've done. Like I said, transient absorption measurements, and we could, I could have them all hidden here, but. So we've done, in terms of looking at electron transfer rates, you know, we've looked at, so this is a, the simplest example, right, where we've, we've taken, well, this is for alumina, and as we, this is basically, these are the transient absorption spectra for increasing alumina thickness, and we're essentially seeing, this is tracking back electron transfer, so higher, so if, we, if, this, if this state's retained, it means the electron is, has not transmitted back, and so a higher, uh, a higher signal here, well, higher th in this direction from zero, uh, indicates uh, that slower back electron transfer, right? This is decay, is sl this is a slower decay than this is, right? So without any ALD, we see a fast decay, fast back electron transfer, here slow back electron transfer. Um, and so we have a number of other measures. With TiO2, we actually don't see much of a change. And we some see some interesting things in the fluorescence, which tells us about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this recombination process. And so we've interpreted some of this. We've not measured this directly. This is the thing that we're working with Tim now because we need to get to uh, picosecond measurements. These are nan all nanosecond uh, measurements, these transient absorption measurements. So we needed a faster uh, measurement system to probe that directly. But I, so I've sort of summarized this. Does that, does that, uh, does that give you, so I've summarized it all here in one slide to make it very simple and not to go into all the details, but I'm happy to discuss more and we have some publications on that. Everybody else asked the questions I was gonna ask. Oh, sure. So, <laughs> I don't have any, but let's thank Barb one more time.